Hi, salam everyone. Thank you for joining us on your Saturday evening. We're really excited to have you all here. My name is Sara. I'm part of the NIAC Leadership Council here in New York City. And we're really excited to have you all here today for what's sure to be an exciting evening of poetry and music. I'm a proud first-generation Iranian American. My identity has driven much of what I do personally and professionally. I first worked with NIAC, the National Iranian American Council, now almost six years ago, and for the past two years have been volunteering with political advocacy here in New York City. The Iranian American community has always lain at the crux of my writing and advocacy personally, but even within our own community, it can be painfully ugly and divisive. But one thing that always brings us together is our shared language and farhang, culture. Don't get me wrong, in middle and high school when my mother would more or less make me learn to read and write in Farsi, lessons that often entailed impossible forays into poetry from Saadi, Rumi, and Hafiz, I was, let's say, disgruntled. I didn't want to spend my precious Saturdays stumbling over difficult Persian poetry. But now, taking advanced Farsi in my, in my graduate program, reading Saadi, Hafiz, and Rumi for a second time, visiting the Shahnameh manuscripts at the Met Museum here in New York, now I realize how much I took my language and culture for granted. I have a newfound appreciation for it and for the work of people like Professor Domenico Ingenito, who joined us here today, who's dedicated his life and career to understanding and sharing the beauty of Persian culture and poetry. And we're so grateful and excited to host him here today. Before we get into the poetry bit of the event, I'm going to turn it over to Zachary Tirgan, who's also part of the New York City Leadership Council for some live music. Salam Dustan Aziz. My name is Zachary Tirigan, and we are New He's Nomad. I'd like to thank Nayak for allowing me to be here tonight at this phenomenal event. We'll begin by playing a song called Angize, and then return after the QA to play five songs off our upcoming record. We hope you'll enjoy. به فردا بود که عمر قص کوتاه تا قلبی هست و میکوبه تا وقتی که نفس دارم نمی بازم نمی افتم تو سختی کم نمیارم آدم و با برشتین نتریقه پشت این رویاست 
پشت وقتیم به دنیا در کام ماست آدم با باورش زن نتری در پشت این رویاست آماده باری شب فوقلاده آدم با باورش زند از حریقه پشت این رویاست خوش وقتیم بگو دنیا در کام ماست آدم با باورش زند از حریقه پشت این رویاست We'll see you soon. Thank you, Zach, and thank you all for that amazing Bahad music. And with that, we'll segue into the poetry part of the evening. And I'd like to briefly introduce Professor Domenico Ingenito, who is Assistant Professor of Persian Literature at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and Director of the Program on Central Asia. His research interests center on medieval Persian poetry, visual culture of Iran and Central Asia, gender and translation studies, and manuscript culture. His most recent articles are Hafiz Shirazi Turk, A Geopoetical Approach in Iranian Studies, and A Marvelous Painting, The Erotic Dimension of Saadi's Praise Poetry in the Journal of Persian Studies. His most recent book is Beholding Beauty, Saadi of Shiraz and the Aesthetics of Desire in Medieval Persian Poetry, which he will be discussing with us tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Ingenito for his presentation. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you so much, Sarah, for such a kind presentation, introduction, and I'm very grateful for all our friends, Nayak, and all the friends who connected from all over the world to be here with us today. I'm extremely excited about, about this event um, because it is the first time since the publication of this book, which is here, that um, I'm, I managed to transgress the boundaries of of an academic audience. So I'm, I'm very excited, happy to be in conversation today with Iranian Americans and, and with all the, the this, this broad audience that, that is here with us today. So um, I will present a few notes, a few remarks about a specific aspect, a specific dimension of my book, uh, specifically from the point of view of sexuality, desire, and, and homoeroticism and in connection with spirituality and mysticism in the poetry of Saadi Shirazi. I would, uh, I'm going to share my, my screen. I prepared the PowerPoint here. I trust you can see it. So the, this is the title of my book, Beholding Beauty. Uh, most of you, I assume, are familiar already with, with the great poet Saadi of Shiraz. Uh, I have here a couple lines that that open the the book the the book cover with this uh, early 14th century manuscript, and I'm particularly uh, fond of this specific line in which Sadi says, "I see Zoroastrians, Christians, and Muslims bowing to worship. We only worship in the direction of our beloved, as enchanting as a painting." So I, I I'm really happy to, to to share these lines with you. Uh, through this manuscript, through this medieval document, and um, also to underline the multicultural, multi-confessional nature of, of love and desire in Sadi's, Sadi's poetry. Um, Sadi Shiraz, uh, as most of you know, flourished during the 13th century, southern Iran in the region of Fars. He studied in the Nizamiya school in Baghdad, probably in the 30s of the, of the 13th century, and was attached in a very loose way to some to specific Sufi orders. Uh, he did seek uh, political and literary patronage throughout his life, which is a very interesting. We will talk about this more you know, extensively later. He's famous mostly for his um, 
so called Bustan or Sadiname or the orchard and the Golestan or the Rose Garden. What I really focus on in my book is the collection of lyric poems, of ghazals or, or love poems. There are three or four collections that he did, you know, to which that he, that he put together at different stages of his life. I also focus on, uh, in my book, on the obscene output of Sadi Shirazi, which, which is quite interesting. Few, few readers know about it. It's censored, of course, in Iran and has never really been published as a critical edition. And I also tried to connect that with Sadi's political endeavors, his, his attachment to, to the political arena of his, of his time, so through his patrons. And, and um, I will be presenting a few, a few images from, from, from medieval manuscripts, medieval and early modern manuscripts. I apologize for not talking about these images at length. Uh, I just wanted to show some of the, the images that have been inspiring my work. Uh, also, after the book was published, because since the book was published, I've been, I've been blessed with the attention of, of many colleagues who work in the field of visual arts and Islamic art in particular. So I really, I really dedicate aspects of, of this talk to, to their presence today and to their help uh, over the past few, few months. And I look forward to, to, to you know, engaging in more conversations with them. In, uh, in, the, in the future, in the near future. Um, I would like to emphasize that the, my main approach to Sadi's poetry is the, most of you who heard about Sadi before, who grew up reading Sadi or were exposed to Sadi here in the US are probably familiar with the ethical moralistic side of Sadi's poetry. And this is the same kind of, dimension with which I was familiar when, when I was studying Persian literature in Italy. And uh, I tried to rediscover Sadi through a different lens, through a different approach, which is more focused on the relevance of beauty and the, the, um, the, the, the practice of admiring, beholding beauty in his, in his, in his works, right? So I, I tried to shift from this ethical, moral aspect of his of his of his works to 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 this this uh, extremely interesting obsession that occupies the very core of his of his poetic activity which is the the possibility of of learning taking pleasure from and and focusing on beauty as a source of 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 uh inspiration for for the understanding of the visible world and also the invisible metaphysical world when we talk about these two aspects um, later. So I, I, I will share a few ghazals, a few poems with you just to, 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 to share what kind of gaze has been guiding my, my exploration of, of Sadi's poetry. And I will read this short ghazal in, uh, in Persian first and then in English. Darman in has kesabram zeni kuruyan means that nafurusham o zohdi nanemoyam kan means eke man zur bebini o ta amul nakoni gar torago vatinast mara em kan means tarke huban e khata tarke huban e khata ein sababas valikem chekonat bande ke bar nafs khodash farman means من دگر میل به صحرا و تماشا نکنم من دگر میل به صحرا و تماشا نکنم که گلی همچو رخ تو به همه بستان نیست ای پری روی ملک صورت زیبا سیرت ای پری روی ملک صورت زیبا سیرت هر که با مثل تو انسش نبود انسان نیست چشم بر کرده بسی خلق که نابینایند مثل صورت دیوار که در وی جان نیست در دل با تو همان به که نگوید درویش ای برادر که تو را در دلی پنهان نیست آن که من در قلم قدرت او حیرانم هیچ مخلوق ندانم که در او حیران نیست سعدی ها عمر گران مایه به پایان اومد همچنان قصه سودای تو را پایان نیست 
This is how I am. I cannot resist the allure of beautiful faces. I sell hypocrisy to no one, and I don't pretend to be a pious ascetic. You see the countenances and refrain from contemplating. I admire your strength as I don't have such endurance. It is virtuous to reject the sin that the Turkic beauties may pose, but what remedy for this sinful gazer who has no control over his carnal soul? No more will I admire the valleys adorned with beauty, for not all fragrant gardens display a rose as beautiful as your cheek. I see a fairy in your visage, an angel in your countenance, and good manners. Listen, anyone who cultivates an affection for you cannot be human. So many people are blind, even with their eyes wide open. They resemble soulless paintings depicted on walls. Oh, brother, the wayfarer on the path won't have to share the pain of this heart, for this is a pain that is no con not concealed from you. I know no creature who is not bewildered by the one whose powerful pen bewilders my senses in awe. O oh, Sadi, your precious life has now come to its end, but the story of your melancholic desire is truly endless. Um, I try to, to refer to the centrality of vision in Sadi's poetry as a sort of a anthropology of vision. This means that for Sadi, throughout his work, throughout his entirety, his entire divans, uh, vision and contemplating beauty are what really makes human beings human, fully human. So it's interesting to see how it's, 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 uh, it's a philo philosophical act, it's a theological act, it is, it is something that um, characterizes the innermost core, the innermost nature of human beings according to, to his approach to, to poetry and to the act of contemplating beauty. Um, I, I emphasize the aspect, the homoerotic aspect, because, uh, and we will talk about this too in the Q&A, because uh, it is something that can teach us about the differences among cultures in the way that desire and sensuality and its connection with spirituality can be reframed in ways that are completely different from the way that we look at se sexuality today and the way we frame a bi binary opposition between homoeroticism or heteroeroticism. So it's interesting to see how study opens for us windows in, in different ways of, of talking about sexuality and desire. And I, uh, in my book, um, I, I try to look at the same sex, same sex component of his of the desire that he displays in this poetry from a political, from the point of view of political activity and from the point of view of sacred homoeroticism. I, here there is another short ghazal. I will read it all in English, but it's interesting to see how Sadi, following a tradition of centuries before him, connects uh, desire, sensual desire with, with political allegiance. No one is more seductive than my beloved Turk. The chain mail of the Crusaders cannot compare with his curly hair. You might not see his comely mouth when he talks, but his lips are not as tight as my broken heart. I happened to hold him strongly in my embrace, but alas, not so strong are the hands of destiny. With the sword of your gaze, you could defeat an army. Plunge your sword as no warrior can compete with you. No one is as gracious as him, but how wondrous that no one better than Sadi can serve Prince Saad, son of Abu Bakr. Um, here, Prince Saad is this, this young prince who, during the, the first three or four decades of Sadi's life, um, inspired the poet to compose lyric poetry. And, and, and uh, in, uh, in my book, and in a couple of articles I published before this book, I, I, I try to show how um, homoeroticism does not necessarily um, convey or reveal an actual practice in Sadi's biographical um, identity, but rather it's a symbolic representation that shows how eroticism at that time, in that specific context, could create, could br bridge the gap between uh, artistic patronage and the presence of, of, of rulers whom Sadi would, would influence and who would guide, offer guidance to them also through the language of love. Uh, and, and it's also 
noteworthy that the Sadi's name is Tahalos's pen name derived from Prince Sa'ad, the son of Abu Bakr. This aspect is something that is found, it comes back all the time later on, even after Prince Sa'ad's death, so after, uh, after uh, uh, 1260, with the new with the new dynasty that was ruling in Iran, right? This is this was one of the most dramatic moments of of in the history of of Iran, uh, mainly because of the invasion of the Mongol armies and and there was a complete revolution in the way that the politics were 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 practiced in in uh, in this region of the world, and and Sadi was there witnessing all these disasters falling upon upon Iran. And, and he very soon also embraced this new political regime, which was the, the Ilkhanid uh, government. And, and he attached himself to the court of, of a ruler known as, of a, known, of, a, of a notable, not a ruler, known as Shams al-Din Jovaini. And here you, we start seeing how the homoerotic aspect, the same sex desire depicted in Sadi's lyric voice, um, reconnects with some form of spiritual afflatus. We will see how in this in this ode, this is the opening of an ode that Sadi dedicated to Shams al-Din, Sadi goes beyond the purely political eroticized discourse and connects this political eroticism, this political homoeroticism with, with a metaphysical um, through a metaphys metaphysical direction. You see how here it says, where is this beautiful boy going? So sweet are his words. What a divine beauty. Why does it appear before my two eyes? For one reason it resembles the sun in the sky. Whenever you contemplate him, your gaze dazzles ecstatically. A mirror is his countenance that kindles the world. Beholding him cleanses the mirror of the heart from all impurities. The royal diploma of beauty and the edict of grace and pulchritude are marked on his rosy face with the golden script of his downy beard, which resembles pure musk molten in fragrant liquor, masterly painted on silk with the finest brush. How can I describe his countenance and lips, a scarlet flame and pomegranate grains? And when he utters words from his sweet mouth, where are the refined spectators who can sweetly honor him? The morning breeze is left to graze his delicate limbs upon its return to the garden, the leaves of spring have dropped. Let me be your subject, oh my dear, if no shame you feel. May I be your servant if your honor is not compromised. Would I ever make you mine? What a glorious destiny. Would I ever turn away from you? How could I dare? I cannot tell anyone the truth about my love for you as I am too jealous for strangers to listen. Anyone in the past would come and go from my heart. There has been no room for others since you made your appearance. You are more precious than my head and life. A covetous fool I am if I didn't scatter them away from you. Passion is not permissible, but lawful may it be to those who, like Sadi, bring love to the threshold of resurrection. And after this erotic opening, there's a long series of lines in which Sadi directly praises this young ruler. And this is a beautiful uh, miniature, beautiful painting that was, was made centuries after during the Safavid period. And it's not connected to the specific text, but it shows the connection in this image of, of a young ruler, a young prince in the hunting grounds and with, with two the dervishes, two mystics and one painter, I believe, contemplating his beauty. Um, what is interesting to me is also to reassess um, the value of Sadi's so-called pornographic works and try to show how pornography, in his case, is something that uh, creates a connection between courtly ideals, idealized love, idealized celebration of beauty, chaste celebration of beauty, and the lower um, movements of, of desire that involve the pleasure of the loins and connect the pleasure of the loins with higher aspirations of the soul towards the quest for God. So I tried to look at pornography as something that should not be dismissed uh, as some sort of just playful uh, peripheral activity that the poet composed to entertain his patrons, but it's something that can be seen as a counter text. 
something, this point you will see what I mean by countertext, how the lyrical voice of Sadi somehow explores the body and the possibility for the body to contemplate beauty from a different angle, more material, more physical, but which is nonetheless connected also with the possibility of the exploring the reflection of God on earth in the way that beauty constantly connects with the invisible world. And I'll start reading these lines. Mah manzuran bote zibayiman sarve ruzafzune jan afzayiman tandarin shahr as kaman nemuye uz ban bar pay jahan peymayiman har kasi ba harifi sar khosh ast va an man kongis hambalayiman. How delightful is it, it is to contemplate that handsome idol of mine, my cypress, who brings light to my days and cherishes my soul. I used to travel across the world, but now my love for his hair keeps me stuck in this city. Everyone enjoys life with their own companion. My companion is a hunk as tall as I am. And you see how the opening of these lines follows the same register of courtly high serious poetry. It's beautiful metaphors, the comparison between the body of the beloved and uh, figures of nature from the garden, like a cypress tree. Uh, the idea of separation from the beloved, uh, the lover longing for his object of desire. But then here in this line, there's a transition in which something is being revealed in this abstraction of the erotic tension. The beloved here appears as, as a, not anymore as an idealized, evanescent, ethereal presence, but as another man. And, and here we see how the register changes, it twists, it shifts towards something that is more physical and, and slightly more compromising. I will, I will now show lines that might, might be disturbing for some friends of ours in this audience. So please, if you do not want to listen to, to these lines that are, can be slightly graphic, please make sure that you either, you know, um, you just don't, don't listen to them, I'm just warning you. So what I love the most is to stick into his ass, the most cherished limb among the limbs of my body. I'm content with his manners, has his sweat, is a source that never satisfies my thirst. Admire the temperance of this mystic, want my erection deserve resurrection. You see here how we have the lyrical idealized description first, then we have this transition to the pornographic, the lower, the base, almost brutal depiction of a sexual intercourse. And then we have this sort of transition toward mysticism and, and showing how mysticism is something that can also connect with the physiology of desire. And, and there's, there are some puns that I, I try to render in this way. This is important because what I translate here as mystic stands for the word in Arabic and in Persian, Aref or Arif, which is the knower, is the person who acknowledges that God is the only necessary being, that God is the only existing presence in the universe. And all that we see is nothing but the reflection of God, of divine beauty. Um, that this is why that in Sadi's specific approach to mysticism and Erfan, uh, the figure of the RF, I translate it as, as beholder, the one who contemplates beauty and recognizes that beauty constantly refers to the presence of God. And what we can do is to, is to admire and celebrate God through the celebration of, of beauty as it filters through the external senses. And I will, I will close here with this interesting line in which the word RF comes back and opens a new window in the possibilities of contemplating metaphysical, invisible beauty of the divine through the presence of a physical object of desire. So this says, Chash mehuta nazaron barbarade surat khuban khat hami binad o arif qalame sulm khudara. On the page-like cheek of the beautiful ones, they see the downy beard. Short is their sight, but the beholder contemplates the pen of God's creation. Here there is a pun in which the word hat, here in Persian, which we found in a few 
lines also earlier uh, in the ode that Sadi dedicated to Shams al -Din. The word khat means several things in Persian. Uh, it can mean line, it can mean uh, also handwriting, writing or scripture, but it can also refer to the, uh, the downy beard, the very first beard appearing on the face of a young male object of desire. Uh, and here Sadi plays with the Chris this pun in which he says that people usually look at a beautiful young man only for the signs of beauty that are usually represented in this case by the, the emergence of the appearance of this downy beard. But uh, Sadi says that they are kutah nazar. Kutah nazar means in Persian both short-sighted, uh, but also narrow-minded. Right. So they are narrow-minded and short-sighted because they cannot see past the physical appearance of beauty. Whereas the true beholder, the true RF, the true mystic, what does he do? He sees in that beard, he sees in those signs of physical beauty, the pen of divine creation, as if the face of beautiful people were hand-written, were inscribed through the pen of God, through his creation. And then Sadi says, everyone's eyes peruse your face with so much passion. The self-worshippers discern no difference between truth and lust. And here to study shows how, what the difference can be between um, admiring beauty for spiritual ends without denying the importance of the body, without denying the importance of the physical experience in exploring uh, the metaphysical aspect of beauty and the, the, the lustful desires that the beholder, the mystic needs to um, acknowledge in order to control. So it's, 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 it's fascinating. I, this is a topic that I, with which I deal in the second and third part of my book, especially in connection with um, a kind of ritual known as Sama or the myst mystical con concert or the mystical audition in which mystics would, would gather together and listen to erotic poetry, listen to Ghazal poetry and try to make use of, of this erotic imagery in order to, to focus on, on divine beauty. So again, without denying the importance of the senses, without denying the centrality of the body, without denying the role of aesthetics in the contemplation of beauty uh, in order to connect with the divine. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely happy now to take questions from, from the audience. Thank you so much, Professor Sanjinito, for that presentation. Um, and thank you for everyone who's engaging with some of the material and the poetry and the comments. Um, I'll start off with some of the questions we've thought of and previous participants have previously submitted. And if others have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll incorporate them as we go. But to briefly start off and from the bigger picture, um, could you please talk to us about, for someone who is unfamiliar, could you describe the importance of poetry in Persian culture and language? And where does Saadi fit in? And why did you specifically perhaps focus on Saadi? Well, Saadi is probably the most important, traditionally is the most important Persian poet in, of medieval Iran. And, and he, for centuries, his works were used in order to learn and teach Persian. So he's, he's the beauty of his language, the perfection of his syntax, the, the elegance of his lines and his prose as well, was what really was elected over the centuries as, a, as an icon, as a model of, of literary perfection. Right? In this, there is an expression in, in Persian derived from Arabic that is Sahlum uh, Umtane, which means um, inaccessible smoothness. So the idea that his style, it's so simple, apparently, it's so compelling and so uh, smooth and natural that when we try to imitate it, when other poets were trying to imitate him, they felt they were failing because they could not reach the same kind of simplicity and, and smoothness. So this is something that really became part of what we can refer to as the, the, the standard aesthetics, right? Inhabiting the tradition, the Persian literary tradition of Iran and the entire Persian speaking world. And then, you know, it was re-explored in different ways and different styles also 
followed what 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 Sadi suggested initially, but this is this is the main role he has. Yes. Thank you. Um, and to follow up, um, in Saudi's time and place, ideas and norms about romantic love and desire were a bit different than a contemporary Iran or contemporary America as it is. So what differences should we keep in mind as we read Saudi? I know you touched upon this a little bit, but if you could elaborate a little bit on it. Well, you know, we, we, you know for instance, we, we, we talk about, and this is a conversation that is happening today, even within the LGBTQ plus community, um, social scientists, psychologists, specialists of the history of sexuality debate over whether sexual desire can be considered as, as, a, as an identity, as, as, a, as, a, as a factor that somehow shapes the, the identity of, of individuals. And, and we, we think in terms of, for instance, of the dichotomy between homosexuality and heterosexuality, right? So we, we, we are used in the West Today, things are changing, of course. Um, we're used to, to think about sexual orientation as, as, a, as a form of identity. So, so we are heterosexual or we are homosexual or bisexual and so on. Is it? Um, what is interesting when we compare our perception with other cultures, especially Persian medieval culture, we, we do find this a more fluid perception and representation of, of desire and sexuality. And um, identity is not particularly important. What is really important in that context is the way that desire is expressed in ways that, uh, in fashions that transgress the boundaries between genders. So we, 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 the differences between sexes, and different differences between genders are much more fluid in the context and this leads to extraordinary examples, like there is this princess, Mongol, Iranian princess, um, whose name is Jahan, and she, she, she lived uh, in Shiraz, and she was active when Hafez was, was active, and she never, she was not hiding her, her biological sex. She, she presents herself as a woman in the way that she introduces her own poems, but she pretends to be a man in love with a young man. So she adopts the homoerotic canon and plays with it in, in ways that, that opens for us windows in a kind of fluidity that we do not really expect right, from, from a, a medieval cultural framework. Thank you. Um, to address some of the questions in the chat. Um, yes. I guess, throw this one out there. We have one question, Rinam. Was Saadi gay? Well, this is a very good question. Uh, gay is a very recent term, right? So, so we, we, when we talk about sexuality, even the difference between sexes, being a man, being a woman, being transgender, these are identities that are shaped also by culture. So the, the word gay describes a very specific cultural uh, representation of, of identity, of sexualized identity and desire. Whereas, which cannot apply to other cultures, cannot apply to other historical frameworks. So, so we cannot even talk about in terms of homosexuality when we talk about medieval same-sex relations and desires. It's a completely different framework. So what is fascinating is that we have the chance through Persian poetry, I think, also to reconsider the ways in which today we, we, you know, we, we can talk about sex and identity at the same time. And then following up on that one recently asked question is how do you compare the concept of love in the moral moral aspect of Saadi's works, training the morality rather than it's more of mystical and political aspects of love in the works of Hafiz and Rumi? Thank you, excellent questions. It's, it's, it's interesting because Saadi um, is a moderate thinker. Saadi tries to find the golden mean in everything and tries to find a center of balance equilibrium, harmony, and everything. So ethics, according to him, are not something that is projected from top bottom as something that has to be uh, embraced by, by, by readers and, 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 and thinkers uh, as, as, a, as an obligation, but it's something that uh, belongs to the practice of, 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 a, of a nuanced approach to 
the ideals of his time. And so aesthetics and the quest for beauty, the appreciation and celebration of beauty belongs to the same kind of, of ethical thinking. So ethics and aesthetics and politics are constantly intertwined with each other. And, and it's, a, it's a shame that over the past few decades, most scholars have, have focused mostly on, on, on the ethical aspect without really emphasizing the importance of, of, of the aesthetic uh, dimension of, the, of his poetry. Going off the notion and the theme of beauty, um, to answer another question, you talk about how Saadi frames beauty in the abstract and how the eyes are a medium through which we access that beauty. And so where does the theme and this understanding of beauty derive from? So can you please repeat the question? So, um, you talk about how Saadi frames beauty in the abstract and how the eyes are a medium through which we access yes. that beauty. Yes. This is a theme that arises frequently in the work of multiple medieval poets. And so um, Kia is asking, where does this understanding of beauty derive from? It's, um, it's, uh, it's religious, it's Quranic, it's cultural, it's uh, both cultural and religious, it's philosophical. It's spiritual, so there are different, you know, the, what, how do we talk about beauty? What are our beauty, the, the ideals of beauty today in our culture? How dif many differences we can find, right? When we discuss what are, so the, what is the canon of beauty? And in this case, I think that there is a, a strong, a strong um, influence played by uh, the connection between mysticism, medieval Islamic and Persian mysticism and philosophy and the way that, especially during the 13th century, something was changing and the role of vision, the role of admiring um, beauty through one's eyes, through the gaze, was connecting also with the scientific paradigms that were circulating and philosophical paradigms that would emphasize the role of the senses, both external and internal senses and imagination in, in making sense in re-reading re the role of, of beauty for our understanding of the world. Thank you. And we had a question earlier about, do you think, after you talk about how at this time, if we have different conception of identity today as opposed to society back then. So do you think that at the time, these aspects of his poetry were understood in the same way and perhaps was society open to homoerotic tendencies? They were, they were, yes, but there were, of course, you know, there were taboos as well. So, for instance, it was not, it was not okay for an adult to be in love sexually attracted to another adult. In, in, in terms. So, for instance, the, the appearance of, of the beard on, a, on the face of a, a young man was, was seen as, as sort of as, the, as, as, a, as, a, as a, as a, as a transi transition toward adulthood and which would somehow uh, bring the connection, the erotic connection to an end. So it's interesting how, um, that's why we cannot really use the category of homosexuality or gayness or even pedophilia. It's a completely different framework that needs to be explored with its own tools and with the, the value that, the values that were, that were found at the time, that were dominant at the time. What, what's important for us to understand that we cannot think of medieval Iran as a more open society than today, just as we cannot think of medieval Iran as a more narrow-minded society if compared with the world in which we live today. So it's, it's, it's what we can learn from this is that everything happens in a cultural context and we need to learn how to read history and how to read historical representations of, of beauty and of desire and sexuality in their own context. Someone related is in the is notion of language and oftentimes gendered language. So going back to an earlier question asked, in Farsi, the he or she pronoun does not exist. So in the process of translating Saadi's poems, how did the translator decide to use the he pronoun? I believe in the first poem you recited he. So if you could speak a little bit about that, please. Yes, absolutely. It's true. It's true. And this is a very powerful um, um, feature that, that uh, allowed Persian poets to transition among genders in ways that in some cases were not as relevant as they would be today. So it's interesting how the problem of gender, when we translate from a genderless language to a gendered language like English, or even so Italian, 
French or Spanish, um, we, the problem you know, uh, that we find is that we need to make sense of that. We need to try to think about how gen our languages reframe gender. In the case of Persian poetry, gender at times comes with not with the with the biographical identity of the poet, but it comes with with the, with a, with what is canonical, what is the what the tradition dictates. So, for instance, the tradition of masnavi or or uh, of romances in verse, like masnavi and manavi, the Shahnameh itself, uh, uh, Leilo Majnun and 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 uh, Shirin and so on. Usually, we do find hetero erotic desire is being portrayed. Whereas in the Ghazal, there is a more of an abstract idea of love that tries not to bring gender in. But in many cases, we do see that that genderlessness, when, try, when it tries to connect with historical reality, when it tries to portray real bodies, real objects of desire, usually steers toward a male Char characterization. So you see how, for instance, in some cases the hat, right, the downy beard of the beloved is mentioned, uh, the, the, the chest of the beloved is mentioned in a very specific shape. There are different names of flowers that are, and then in the in the in the in, in the pornographic material that we find everything is extremely explicit, right? So we have different nuanced ways of talking about gender and, and the language. Is you know allows poets allow poets to be extremely creative in in in, in uh, shifting among different characterizations of what gender could have been. So I think you touched on the answer to one of the questions asked in terms of classical Persian poets frequent use of the word pesad when referring to an object of desire, but almost never to dochtar. So would you say there was an aversion to using the word dochtar, or could you expand a little bit more upon that? It's interesting. Um, from a sociological point of view, of course, men could not access the presence, you know, female presence freely. So it is true that there was more a segregation of uh, among sexes. Uh, but it's also true that during Sadi's lifetime, with the Mongol presence, there was there was a revolution also in the in the visibility of women within the culture. So we have many more women writing poetry and sharing their own poetry during that time, especially during the time of Hafez one century later, and even more so later on. So this is one, one factor, but it's interesting to see how the ideal of desire is homoerotic also because it allows a certain kind of flirtatious playfulness. So the fact that um, sexual connections between men and women was more transactional, determined by the families, was determined by social and religious values that could not be transgressed. The, the connection among men allowed for a kind of um, shifting boundaries in which the playfulness of seduction could work much better, even in the poetic creation. Right? And this is in a way, you know, some, some poets never probably never really touched another man. And they probably, and maybe they, they just wrote their homoerotic poet, poems for their entire lives, or vice versa. So it's interesting to see how this is always open to discussion when we look at, at the way that society uh, was, was shaped by, by different values and how the, the um, connections among sexes right, was, was, was different from, from the ways that we imagine it today. Thank you. And to what extent would you say the concept of homosexuality, homoeroticism, I believe you use more, is prevalent in Saadi's works? Is it just a few poems you'd say? And what is the extent you'd characterize the covering of homoeroticism in other medieval Persian poets' work? Um, homoeroticism is very common in the, in the lyrical canon. So amatory poetry when it's lyrical and not romance, long romances in verse like Maestabis, it's usually there is this stronger emphasis on, on, on homoeroticism. Uh, I would say that Sadi among all classical poets, more than Rumi, for instance, there is this whole idea that Rumi and Shams were lovers. Probably Rumi was the, one of the few uh, Persian medieval poets who strongly opposed 
the celebration of male beauty for spiritual ends. This is very interesting, as I said, this is worthwhile exploring uh, in the near future. But in the case of Sadi, there is something about Sadi that, that is, 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 has been, you know, was unsettling even for some of his contemporaries, some of his more conservative contemporaries and interlocutors would, would describe this obsession of his of looking at male beauty as a source of inspiration. And, and some, some religious scholars who were inspired by his poetry when they met him, they, they would say, Sadi only thinks about, only wants to talk to handsome men. He doesn't really care about anyone else. And then there's the, so it's interesting to see how also there is some sort of biographical appreciation that transgresses the boundaries of what is canonical and what, what, what Sadi was writing only on the basis of the tradition that precedes him. So this is also interesting. And it, it, it's, it's, um, it's also interesting to see how other poets were inspired by him and transformed his balance between physical and metaphysical desire into a discourse that was only religious. For instance, uh, poets like Mohamed Tabrizi or Seyf Farghani were inspired by Sadi, but they chose to highlight only the spiritual aspects of his homoeroticism. Thank you so much. And I'm going to wrap it up with one final packaged question. Thank you everyone for submitting thoughtful questions. Um, we wish we could get to them all tonight, but we want to end on the fact that many have pointed out that the erotic poems of Saadi and the Saadi's work, they were not, people weren't really taught that growing up a lot of people. And so do you have any insight into how Saadi and his work is taught in Iran today? And someone asked also if the erotic poems of Saadi have been published anywhere. Uh, they have been published. Everything has been published, but censored, of course. So you have many coughs that mean several things according to the kind of uh, spicy word that is going to be used in the texts. There are no real critical editions of many of his works. So his obscene poems were published after the 90s, after the late 80s in Iran. Uh, but there, there was no real comparison among manuscripts. So I'm myself preparing now a, a critical edition of his obscene and political works. And the way the Sadi is taught, um, Sadi in Iran today is taught as a, as a moralist. So he's, he's seen as a, as a, as a model for, for, uh, for a, a, a mainstream uh, ethical set of values that, that, are, that make sense within the framework of education within the Islamic Republic of Iran. Of course, the, the erotic aspect is not really explored. And it's interesting to see how eroticism is, is, um, is analyzed with much more of an in-depth uh, gaze in uh, in Afes poetry rather than study, even in Iran. So this is interesting. Thank you so much, Professor Anginito, for answering a barrage of questions and um, for your presentation and all your insights and for making Persian poetry so accessible to a wider audience. And with that, I will turn it over to Zach again to finish off the event with some music. Thank you. What a phenomenal presentation by Professor Ingenito. We'll be playing our next song called And Love Is. Hope you enjoy. <laughs>
song we'll have a music video being released in april and our album is released on march 19th my birthday
as the East River flows, bright light shards from all the condos. Taillight streak red, and they make your face glow. It's getting late, but I don't want to leave.
Before we play our final song, I'd like to acknowledge the musicians here with me today. To my right on guitar, Sholi Gutman. To my left on drums, Daniel Bonfilio. And behind me on bass, my younger brother, Darius Sturgeon. We hope you all have had a phenomenal night, and we hope to see you soon. Just as it comes to be The world is spinning just to play with me Fill my glass with empathy As I try to find myself Through the eyes of someone I cannot see My independent identity Keeps spilling into everybody else They take my youth and taint my innocence If time could go in rivers Would I even take it back? Question me for who I am Force my hand and break the dam In my mind you'll fade unless you choose to stay this bed I can't sleep in, it's just like the one at home. But you don't look at me no more, am I a ghost? My independent identity keeps spilling into everybody else. These melancholy memories, they take my youth and taint my innocence. Time could go in rivers. I wouldn't take it back. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight.